The next lecture is about geoengineering, environmental and health effects of jet plane pollution. And this is divided in two speakers. Uh, I will try to cover uh, the physical reasons why you are seeing trails in the sky. Uh, and uh, my colleague, Desiree Röver, will cover the health effects. So that means that when we are shifting computers, you have time to breathe, but you must not leave. My name, as you maybe know, is Frank Rasmussen. I'm actually 45 years old. I'm an educated mechanical engineer in Aarhus Engineering School. And uh, when I'm not arranging conferences and doing lectures, I'm uh, having an engineering company where I work with environmental technologies for wastewater treatment plants and industries. And I have a lot of my mind, so that means that if some of the things I'm telling you, uh, you don't try to catch it, you have a chance to go into the openmindconference.com homepage, dot, uh, dot on speakers, Frank Rasmussen, and then you can download the article you have here. I know it's in Danish, but uh, most of you are from Sweden or from Denmark. So, uh, and, and in this 17 pages, which is updated uh, very uh, recently, I try to explain what is going on in the sky. So if you don't get everything I tell you, you have a chance, okay? The definition of geoengineering is the intentional large-scale manipulation of the environment, particularly manipulation that is intended to reduce undesired human-caused climatic change. This is one of the leading scientists, David W. Keefe, who have written that. He has been publishing a lot of uh, scientific documents about geoengineering. And for the record, when I talk geoengineering or chemtrails, maybe I say sometimes geoengineering, maybe I say sometimes chemtrails, but I mean the same. Just then you know that. My interest in geoengineering is because I have been sailing since 1970 and I've looked at many clouds. Uh, I even sailed a lot of regattas and if you want to win regattas, then I, I didn't win too much. I'm not as good at, as Jesper Bank, maybe you know him from Olympic Games. But uh, in order to sail fast, you need to understand the clouds. So I have been sitting like this for many hours in my life. And that's the reason why I've noticed that something changed. In the good old days, the sky looked like this. You see some airplanes coming by, you see natural clouds, and you see the condensation trails behind the plane, but it disappeared again. And this is very normal. But if we continue to the typical sky today. This is a time lab taken in the city of Tim. Maybe some of you knows that you can buy good cheese from Tim. They advertise with Tim Lee Gold. Um, the sky, maybe I should start it, sorry. Yes, you can see on the flag that, it's, uh, uh, that we have speeded up what is happening. But what you see is that the sky is covered with this sort of man-made clouds. And it just continue. You can be lucky that some days that you have a blue sky with no airplanes. Uh, but most days, oh, I'm sorry for the quality, most days it's very, very, uh, a lot of, of trails in the sky. And the reason is, why is that happening? And I will try to explain that. <clears throat> I will just give you some examples. I was on a business trip to Holland, and we were enjoying a cup of coffee, and what a nice view. So we took two cups of coffee. In Copenhagen, some friends for me have sent them over there. 
my youngest kid in Silkeborg, I have to send him in school in the morning. From Sweden, from space, you see the trails going in space. I don't know if this is working. <clears throat> also from space, where you see you see Denmark in the right upper corner, and you see England, and you see Holland is have a lot of trails, and uh, nothing in France, nothing in the northern part of Germany. Here's another um, picture from Denmark and Sweden and Norway. What you can see especially over Sweden is that there are again some artificial clouds made by jet planes. Here it's very, very uh, obvious that something is happening. And I've been studying this for quite some time and uh, been looking up a lot of hours uh, and wondering and, and uh, what you see is actually typical. Um, you see a, a line, a straight line, and then it moves and, and then you have another line. And, and the official explanation, which is actually pretty good, is that, that the wind is coming from the west and that's the reason why the liner moved and then you have a new airplane in the same path. And that could be the truth. But uh, if you use uh, a program called Flight Radar, you will, uh, you will see that uh, about 70% of all civilian airplanes, uh, that is something you can download to your iPhone or to your Android phone. At 70% of all uh, civilian airplanes, ca can you get the data, but you cannot get any data from the military planes. So there are 70% chance that if you have Flight Radar that you can see that it is a, a plane, a civilian plane, but if you cannot see it and it's making a long trail, uh, then it could also be a military plane. Uh, I will not go too much into plane types and things like that because I only have an hour and I could easily speak in five. Here, just to give you an idea about what is how many passengers are actually moved about I would say about five billion passengers are moved per year and actually you can also see here when the crisis hit the world in 2008 the the flight and the passengers uh, among, uh, the, the total number of, of flights and, and, and passengers was reduced very much but then when we were around New Year 2008 and nine, then we are back in, in business again. And of course, you see the flight that all the transport that didn't do in 2000, they, they, they actually increased that. So, so, so in, in general, we have from 2009 and forward, we have more uh, passengers and cargo transported with air than we had before. If we try to to show you uh, a picture, you can actually see when America go to sleep, when Europe wake up, and when uh, China go to sleep or wake up. This is a lot of airplanes. I think I've read that there was about 30,000 planes in the air every hour. So of course you cannot see them all here, but, but you can see now America was going to sleep, they're starting to wake up, then soon Europe will go to sleep, and in the night the traffic falls. But it gives you an impression about how many planes they are moving around on the earth every day. And just to show you some jet planes, normally when you look at a jet plane, and it's a, a, a clean 
condensation. What happens is that you have some fuel you burn in a motor, and when it comes out, it's hot, but it mixes with the air, which is cool. So it's the same thing as you are in the winter time or in a very hot room, and when you go out, you can actually blow out water vapor, and you see that it gets icy. But because they get the same temperature as the surroundings, it disappears again. That's also why when you're smoking a cigarette, you will see that the, the smoke is actually leaving uh, the cigarette because there are particles in it. And all this particle uh, theory I'm uh, explaining in a short while. But normally when you see this, this motor is either very, very bad functioning because normally when you make a condensation trail, there should be, uh, you say, about uh, one to tw uh, two, uh, the length of the airplane two times to 20 times, and then you should have a normal condensation trail. This is information I had from uh, DME. Here's another example. And this is uh, one of the better ones. And, and uh, some claims that this is a fuel dump, but fuel dumps are always made out in the ends of the wings simply because of the, uh, the hazards of uh, getting fire. So you want that very long away from the motor. There are a lot of theories about how chemtrails are coming out of airplanes from motors, additive to motors, additive to the fuel, uh, even uh, some people who change the toilet are the people who put in the liquid which are coming out of, of... There's a lot of theories about that, but I cannot prove any of that. What I'm trying to prove is that, that the pollution from an airplane is a big environmental problem. The other thing is speculation. It could be true, maybe not true, but it's not so important. One of the best evidence, if we should talk, is still this uh, film where you see a uh, KC-10. Um, uh, uh, the Americans uh, and NATO have three types of tank airplanes, and these tank airplanes are actually um, used in the Cold War to f refuel the B-52s, which were filled with atomic bombs. So if the Russians were sending the missiles to bomb uh, America, then they had all these B-52s ready to retaliate. Um, but we don't have any Cold War more, so we have about 700 tankers. That's the total amount in the NATO American fleet. And they are now reused for other purposes, which this film indicates. Now it starts again.
awesome. I'm going to put this on YouTube. <laughs> And he did, and now everybody can just go in and watch it. The good explanation is that, just to make a definition of chemtrails and contrails, the chemtrails is the one who stay in the sky, and the contrails is like water vapor, it disappears again. Here is another example, where you have a big chemtrails, and then you have a contrail after a jet. They can develop in many different kind of ways. Uh, I got this from a Swedish homepage uh, where you have said one minute, two minutes, five minutes, but the clouds going from a chemtrails and then it develop. And this is also what, what in the end with a lot of jet planes creates this uh, uh, Cyrus uh, cloud cover. So the big question is, have the atmosphere changed? Because if the atmosphere had changed, it would actually were be easy. We could just go home. We had no problems. But uh, Professor Eichel Coase, working for Danish Meteorological Institute, he said no. And his senior, sci senior scientist, Johannes K. Nielsen, he also said there are, to my knowledge, no physical conditions that have changed. So we can now conclude that the specialists are saying that the atmosphere have not changed, so it's not a natural reason why the airplanes now are making very long chemtrails instead of short contrails. But I'm not sure that he's entirely true, because if you look at the humidity in the atmosphere, maybe you can also find some information which are going the other way, you know, that's the good thing about the internet. So when you are starting studying this, you have to be really critical and say that, but I'm trying to help you. I have been very critical. I'm trying to help you here, but I'm like Barry Trower, not an expert. It's just become, you see, my destiny to talk about this in order to get the public to wake up and get some debate in, in the society. But what you see here is especially interesting for the blue line, which is the humidity measured in the in the altitude where the, where the airplanes are flying from 9 to 12. This is 9 kilometers. And what you see is that the, 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 um, the red line, the vertical line, is starting about 94, 95. And this is also where the official geoengineering chemtrail uh, program started. And the funny thing is that, that the chemtrails are tell you about that later on, affects the humidity in the air. So if you have a lot of particles where the humidity can, can sit on, then it will also uh, mean that the humidity you have in the air are sitting on this particle, and in the end this particle wants to go down to the earth because of gravity. And it's funny that when you look at, at the nine kilometers where most planes are, another thing which is interesting with this is that the the IPCC states that water vapor is more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. So that means that if we should have global warming, as the scientist states, then the humidity in the atmosphere should be gone up and not down. So I have to agree with the Danish scientist called Henrik Svensmark, who in his book, Climate and Cosmos, states that we have global cooling and not global warming and that geoengineering in the end is causing the warming. Just to, again, to clarify some things, um, I really, if you take the area where the troposphere is standing, uh, under 8,000 meters and minus 38 degrees is not possible to cause what you naturally call a persistent contrail. Some call chemtrails persistent contrail, that means a contrail which will not disappear. But if you are over 8,000 meters, you can make natural persistent contrails, but that needs, again, minimum minus 38 degrees, 
It means that the air is oversaturated. That means that the, uh, sorry, the humidity is oversaturated. That we have more than 100% humidity, and we need very uh, no wind conditions. This is again uh, data I have directly from Meteorological Institute. So, when we see chemtrails or persistent contrails under eight kilometers then something is wrong. And when we look at clouds, I will not bore you with a lot of things, but two things are important here. Uh, we have the Cyrus clouds, which is from 8 to 10 kilometers, where the planes are flying. And uh, they, funny, is draw, the drawing is like that, and they have a name called Cirrus Aviaticus. Actually, uh, even the specialist in this field knows that jet plane pollution causes uh, environmental problems. Um, the other cloud which is important, and you many times also we see, is cumulus, which you can see is about two to four kilometers high. And everybody knows that a cumulus cloud is a, a nasty thing when you are on the beach and a cumulus cloud is coming around because then it gets cold and you hope, go away, go away, and then it goes away and it's, it's warm again, and it's simply because the surface of the cumulus clouds reflects the sunlight back, and that's the reason why it don't hit you when you are laying on the beach having, having a relaxing time. But the skies also have a function, which also is a fact, is that Cyrus clouds' function is that they are making a carpet all over the world, or where the area where the chemtrails, geoengineering, are made, it's working like a carpet. So cirrus clouds are holding the heat down to the earth, where cu cumulus clouds are reflecting it back. So if you cr create a lot of cirrus clouds, you're actually increasing the temperature on the globe. That's why cirrus clouds increase the global warming, and cumulus clouds decrease. And this is also a fact. You cannot deny this. So it's very funny that we have a lot of discussions in the media with global warming. We even need to be taxed every time we breathe out. And at the same time, we make an artificial cloud cover which increase the global warming. I will present the theory why Kim Trails is created in the sky, and um, as I told you earlier on today, uh, nanoparticles play an uh, important role here. That's also why I was very happy that Rasmus Folberg of Aarhus University would tell us about nanoparticles, because I think it's a technology for the future, and some of it could be good, but as you also could see, some of it could also be very bad. And in the sky, I must admit, it's bad. If we take the Danish Meteorological Institute again, they, in this article, state the indirect effect. Aviations are also likely to cause cloud formation using a different mechanism. Air emitting particles, aerosols, which is particles also are called, which can act as a nuclei on which the water can condense. And you have to notice that DME is an institution under the Ministry of Climate and Energy. So the scientists here are not just people who can speak freely. As I think most of you have got an idea with the lectures we had before, is that maybe the government have another agenda than the people. So, but the important thing is here, at, this is the first place where the state that the nuclei, the, the aerosol, the particle can work uh, can get the water to condense around it. This is stated by Svensmark. Uh, maybe some of you, I think Danes, remember him. Uh, during the, the climate uh, meeting in Copenhagen, he was the scientist who, uh, I, I, yeah, who what, what do you call that, got, uh, lost his conscience in, in, in the studio on, on live TV and, and just and that was because of his pacemaker. So he didn't have anything to say, and I think there was a lot of 
people who were happy that he didn't open his mouth, but I can, I can do it for him. The theory Svensmark uh, had made, which is uh, confirmed by Aarhus University, Copenhagen University, and CERN in what is called the Cloud Project, is following. When you have stars and supernovas exploding out in space, which you see on the top there, they can come. The particles from these exploding stars travel through the space and they can hit uh, in direction of the Earth. And depending about the energy level they have, they can actually um, reach uh, the atmosphere of the Earth. As you see, they, have, they need to go through the Sun magnetic field and the Earth magnetic field and then the Earth atmosphere. So the theory Svensmark have is very simple. The more cosmic radiation, he calls this, exploding stars is cosmic radiation. The more cosmic radiation we have, that means the more particles hitting the Earth from space, the more cloud cover we have. And the interesting thing is that the perfect cloud condensation nuclei, which he calls this particle where the water condenses around, is 100 nanometer. So notice the 100 nanometers. It could also be smaller. And you also see the energy level is also important. If you have a lot of high energy and big particles, you get a lot of cumulus clouds. But you can also just have you know, very small clouds, uh, cirrus clouds, because the particles are so, uh, the, the energy from it and the mass from it and the speed from it is, have, have, do not have more energy to, to, uh, than to get to about 10 kilometers. And then again, the water will condense around the particle. But you need a nanoparticle to do this. If we look at scientific report from 2008, an overview of geoengineering of climate using stratospheric sulfur aerosols, they conclude with jet exhaust nanoparticles of approximately 10 to 80 nanometers. So even in scientific uh, reports, they are stating that the exhaust, the particles from the exhaust from the jets is 10 to 80 nanometer. This is, um, I need to watch out, I'm, 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 I'm still good on schedule. Um, in Copenhagen airport, a, a baggage handler had uh, liver cancer and uh, his uh, union, 3F, uh, would like to have the working conditions for this bag of handles um, examined. So they uh, made a co an agreement with the DTU and Aarhus University, and they put up some uh, particle counters, simply machines who count how many particles are in the air. And they did that at... Uh, uh, at the locations you see here, uh, station B4 is the most important. And what they measured was quite interesting. As you can see, uh, the nano uh, size and the particle, and you see that you have station B4, which is there where all the airplanes are docking. Uh, they have measured a very high amount of nanoparticles. And as you also heard from Rasmus Folberg, the smaller the nanoparticles is, the more severe it could be to your health. And unfortunately here, for this baggage handler, the most of them are very, very small. Actually, uh, this report is called Air Pollutions in Airport. You can search on the internet and read it. It's a very interesting report, which I have more information here. And um, the most important from... Uh, uh, the, they make some calculations in the report. The baggage handler working I think was six or eight hours a day. He inhaled 240 billion nanoparticles during one workday. And I remember Kor Press Christensen, who is a scientist from DTU, had a conclusion. He said, we don't know much about the health effects, but we don't think it's healthy. Another thing which is very, very interesting with this report is that we, and I, 
you know, I, I search a lot to find evidence because I only think that we are able to change a, a bad development by providing evidence which people cannot put away as a conspiracy theory. So, so this report was uh, it's pretty fantastic. As you can see, jet fuels contains high concentration of sulfur, about 1,000 ppm. In comparison, the sulfur content in diesel fuel is 10 ppm. That means there are 100 times more sulfur in jet fuel than there are in diesel. When that is burned in an aircraft engine, it creates 1,000 times more particles. I just showed you what the particle sizes were. Per kilo fuel compared with a modern diesel engine. And we already know that diesel engine is, is absolutely not a perfect machine. It, it's, it's a problem down here. But up there you have a problem which is a thousand times bigger. The, in engines, most sulfur is oxidized to SO2, that's uh, uh, sulfur oxide, which leaves the engine as, uh, or as sulfur oxide or as sulfur particles. Or, um, that is also uh, known as ammonium sulfur particles. And what you see here, I can see my, my, my um, picture is not too good, but this is ammonium sulfur. You can actually buy that. I just searched for a picture for ammonium sulfur, and this is a particle. And as you also heard from, from Rasmus, is that it's possible to have a bulk of a material and then turn it into nanoparticles. You just need to have something to start on. Um, but here, the, 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 uh, the process in the engine are creating this salt. Ammonium sulfate is a salt. <clears throat> what they also state in the report is that the NOx from the motors are reacting with the ozone in the surrounding air. And what is important to know here is that from the 70s to the 80s, they actually increased the mileage of an airplane, so if we have one liter of jet fuel, it could fly one kilometers in the 70s, and in 1980, it could fly two kilometers, so they doubled it. And the reason they did that is to increase the pressure in the motor, but that also create a lot of knocks. Or, and you see one of the conclusions is that aircraft engines are believed to be a key source to inorganic sulfur particles due to the high sulfur content in jet fuel. Aircraft engines are the key source to sulfur oxide in airports. If we look at, again, a report, I just need to see, yeah. That is the old report from 2008 again. They actually state there where you can see you have the red, that air, sulfur, and soot. And this is, again, a geoengineering. And you see here that it actually are a way working like when you have a volcano. The volcano is making a lot of sulfur oxide in the air, and the sun uh, are reflected. And that is also the reason why w this is happening, because we need to have a reason to the public when they get outraged about this pollution that we are doing this in order to combat global warming. The problem is that if you look at the cloud function, they're doing the opposite. If we go back to, again, a very old report from 1999, they state, the net effect is positive and condensation trails therefore have a net warming effect on the Earth atmosphere. So they even, in their own reports, conclude that too many trails in the air are causing global warming. And as I conclude down there, geoengineering chemtrails create artificial cyrus clouds, increase the global warming. And Svensmark states in his book that if we should have been looking at the cosmic, uh, the exploding stars and supernovas and the particles raining down on the Earth, we should have had global cooling since 95, simply because the cloud cover is less. The other thing which is very alarming is that geoengineering and the ozone layer is often mentioned in scientific 
uh, reports and uh, in articles. And here you see that sulfur injections are one of several geoengineering solutions to climate change being discussed by scientists. But data publics and science journals suggest the strategy would lead to drastic thinning of the ozone layer. So even the scientists working with geoengineering as this, the, uh, the, the way to solve this global warming issue knows that this will damage the ozone layer. And how much will it damage? According to this old report again, I could show you a lot of other reports. If you search on geoengineering and ozone layer, I don't know how, ma how many millions hits you will get, but a lot. But here, it again, is very, very accurate. Geoengineering may have a significant impact on the ozone layer with a possible decrease of in the ozone by additional 40 to 50 dobson units. And I try to explain down there that normally in the ozone layer you have 250 to 300 dobson units. So the reduction is 20% or maybe more. This is still an official report. So that means that there are, with this geoengineering going on in the atmosphere, a 20% higher risk to get cancer in your skin as a minimum. Just to, again, show you some pictures of nano. Um, here you see, this is taken from a city, but it is order for you to show that a nanoparticle is just not a round piece. It, it could actually uh, be more than one metal in one nanoparticle. As you can see here, you have mangane, iron, zinc, uh, silver, so there are a lot of different kind of metals which could act actually on the same nanoparticle. Here they also state ultrafine aerosols, less than 100 nanometer, constitute the largest portion of ambient aerosols loading by number and are, are highly time and location dependent because that was in the city. But what they also state here is and impact both human health and global climate. We go back to David W. Keefe, who actually are working very hard to, to, uh, to, to make the best geoengineering as possible. Of course, it's not going on, so please look away. And, and, and I think the funny thing about this article is that it's called Leviathan nanoparticles make, make for better geoengineering. But if they're not doing geoengineering, why should they make better geoengineering? And what he suggests here is to, to make a disk five microns in diameter and 50 nanometers thick. The disk is primarily made out of two layers, metallic aluminum and barium titanate. And this is barium and aluminum are sub are, are, are metals which are found in a lot of lab tests in rainwater all over the world, especially in, in USA, Canada, Europe, and also now Australia, which is the areas which are most affected by gear engineering. The funny thing is, it's also where the white people lives. I wondered about that. The reason why you want this nanoparticle disk is that aluminium um, combined with barium, they have two different kind of masses, so they will stay, stay in the air, so the aluminium will reflect the sunlight back, and the barium would keep it like, so it, it, it was not upside down. And, and, uh, and the, as you also saw uh, from uh, Rasmus Folberg's article, is that these nanoparticles could, could work together with the electrical charge which are in the atmosphere. So if you can make something, a very small particle, work with the, the, the electrical uh, field in the atmosphere, you can actually have the, uh, the disk to go up. This is what this article is about. But notice aluminum and barium. The f even the mainstream popular scientific magazine Illustrated Wittenskap here in Denmark have written on the front page that condensation trails nine double the global warming effect. So 
when I saw that, I was thinking, okay, I'm not a total idiot. And um, another thing which I also think the older people of you notice is that we don't have a very deep blue sky anymore. It's a little bit milky white. I often say to my kids, unfortunately, you haven't seen a real sky. Maybe I'm a bad father, but, but that's reality. And if you look at the green, and I like the green development. I'm maybe not agreeing in, in, in all what is going on today, but I think we as human beings must minimize the impact we have on, on this earth. But if you look at the effects the sun have on so solar cells, on solar heating system, it is actually reduced 20% because of the widening. The solar cells and the, the heating uh, uh, panels are working on direct sunshine. And if the air above you is polluted with nanoparticles and making this white, uh, dusty sky, then you are reducing the power your sun so this means that you, if you have invested in a sun uh, uh, cell uh, system, you should actually be complaining because you could have a 20% bigger payback time and a faster payback time than you have today. I, did, I sent this article actually from Stephen Saunders to the, um, uh, what do you call, for evening, <laughs> Association of Sun cells uh, and, and ask them that I think they as an association should fight for better quality in the air of many reasons but minimum for the reason that they could offer their, their customers 20% higher payback time. Of course I did not receive any answer. <laughs> but I talked to a journalist from Extrablad about it. Uh, me and Mass Vidal Please stand up, Mess. We have, uh, we have uh, made a campaign in Extrablad where Mess with, he put some of my article in. And he did that the 26th of June. And one month ago, we had over 25,000 people who support the case of what is going on in the sky. And then the of course, the extra players should have contacted us several times before we reached the 25,000. But they did, we contacted them and then they made an article. And during the weekend, 40,000, 40, uh, 14,000 people actually had hit on this. So around 42,000 people in Denmark are aware that something is wrong in our sky. And I think that's positive. A HEPA filter is uh, a filter actually as you have in your car, which need to be changed. Um, in Phoenix, uh, and, and this is uh, some years old, they put up this filter for 24 hours, and then they took the filter down and they measured. And this is the amount of different kind of metals they measured. And you see, for example, cadmium is 126 times over the toxic limit. Barium, manganese, copper, zinc, everybody's over. So, so the air quality in Phoenix at that time was indeed very, very bad. There are other examples. This is lab test from rainwater in Sweden. And you can see on the left here that you have barium very high, boron very high, silver high. Silver you, for example, used, and this is official news, before the Olympics in China, you, uh, you spray silver iodide over the skies and then it don't rain at the Olympics, it rains before the clouds are coming into Beijing. They also uh, did the same with parades in Russia. So this is very old stuff, 50 years. So, um, but the fo it, you should also notice that in the, on the right side that they have measured some uran. And normally when you are measuring rainwater, 
you can measure in earth and then you have a lot of metals. Of course, aluminum is a, a natural part of the earth. Too much aluminum is not good, but you need aluminum. But in rainwater, you should not have anything. And if you have measured aluminum, arsenic, uran, boron, magnesium, natrium, whatever you measure in rainwater, then there is a pollution problem. It's as simple as that. So, why are we seeing this? There are many reasons for this, and it's impossible for me to cover this subject in, in, in this time. Uh, I, I do it much better in my article than I do it here, but one of the things which is worth thinking about is that Monsanto actually had taken a patent on crops, on seed, to uh, corn, different kind of corn, which is aluminum resistant. You see there's a picture from a test field over there. And that means that if the earth is polluted with aluminum, which some of the geoengineering I already showed you, uh, uh, the patents and articles are, uh, about it uh, uh, explained, then we are actually also ready to, uh, to grow food. The problem is that Monsanto is not a company who have the best reputation. It has made PCB, it has made dioxin, Agent Orange was what they sprayed over Vietnam in order to have all the trees to, to die so they could see where Viet Cong moved the troops. So, so even that I would give Monsanto the credit that they are trying to do something good here, I think that maybe they know something we don't know and they are ready. And when you are, the farmers are buying seed from Monsanto, they cannot just harvest the corn and use it, put it in the silos and use it next year because in the contract with Monsanto it's written that the property of this corn is to Monsanto. So the year after they need to, to, um, to saw the, the field again, they have to call the agent of Monsanto and say, we need another seed to plant. And if they do it, they actually have hired a very old detective called Pilkington. Maybe you heard about it, I, I think about. Yeah. But, um, but they, they are they're using mafia methods to the farmers who try to violate this rule. And that means that Monsanto, Syngenta, and maybe a few other companies will be in total power of the money supply on the earth. So if aluminium, barium is sprayed in the sky, landing on the field, those are the ones who will gain. Again, follow the money and normally you get something which could be right. Another thing which is important, and I'm, I'm still on schedule, so that's great, um, is from the University in Duisburg in Essen. They, they write this, aerosol chemistry and physics. Atmospheric aerosols have a significant influence on human health chemical compound deposition, cloud albedo. Albedo is the, uh, the mirror effect of the clouds to mirror the sun back into space. Cloud condensation, and CNN is cloud condensation nuclei, and atmospheric turbidity. The role, and now it's beginning to be important, the role of the atmospheric aerosol particles in the radioactive transfer within the atmosphere by scattering and absorbing electromagnetic radiation makes them an important parameter in modeling the Earth climate. So it's not a conspiracy to say that some universities on this Earth are very interested in geoengineering and the possibilities about changing the Earth climate because a lot of reports are telling us that. If this is knowledge, you can find it on the internet, there's nothing hidden. But absorbing, scattering and absorbing electromagnetic radiation 
leads me to the last subject I will cover, and that is geoengineering and weather modification. To make it very simple, uh, I have come to follow a conclusion. I cannot be sure that this is the true, but this is my best. When you are having a lot of geoengineering activity, you are having a lot of nanoparticles in the air. That is a fact. The nanoparticles at attract the humidity in the air. So the more nanoparticles you have, the more humidity is, at uh, is sitting on these particles. So if you, for example, would like an area to have drought, or maybe make sure that the neighbor country should have drought, you geoengineer and you don't do anything else because all the nanoparticles in the air attach this uh, humidity and are not leaving the air. But if you combine the chemtrails with electromagnetic radiation at, at very low frequencies, and this is the beam you see here, up here is, is the, I, I just call it HAB, it's an ionosphere heater. It has two purposes. It can actually, if we have the ionosphere here, it beam up electromagnetic waves and it can actually make a, a bulb on the atmosphere, which will create an under pressure beneath so it sucks in the system to fill it up. But if you use other frequencies, and this is pulse up and hit the ionosphere, it can also use the ionosphere like a radio signal. When you're driving in your car, the radio signal hits the ionosphere and go down to your antenna in your car and you listen to music. So there's nothing new about this. But when it hits the ionosphere and it bounces back, you actually can see that it's happening. And I think everybody understand how big problem this is after listening to Barry Trower yesterday, because what Barry Trower he talks about is totally the same as this. This harp installations all around the world, we have them in Tromsø in Norway, we have them in Louis in Sweden, we have them in Max Planck Institute in Germany, we have them in Holland, we have them in Wales, so they are all around us, and they can hit special spots in the ionosphere, and when and when it works like a mirror, it goes back on, so, you know, they, they, they can decide where, which is the area we want to hit. So what you can notice is that if you have a lot of geoengineering activity in an area, then notice if the clouds suddenly are looking like they are, um, like a sinus quo is going through them. Because normally clouds, I think everybody can agree, are not symmetric. Clouds is made, you know, wild. But with this technology, it's actually a becoming symmetric. And this is because that the very low frequency of the electromagnetic radiation are reacting with the metals, which you saw in the rain world. And in that way, you can create an artificial low pressure. So I state that when we have a lot of geoengineering activity going on and we afterwards see the clouds like this, I have another example just over my house, you can see it there, then this harp plants are actually very, very active. And what is happening here is that the metals in this artificial cloud is actually beginning to get in resonance at very low frequencies, it's moving like this, and when it moves, it warms up the air. And you know, warm air is raising up, and the more the particles is uh, raising up in the atmosphere, the more humidity can actually uh, attach to this particle. And in the end, it grows big, so big that the gravity of this particle is, will fall down to the earth as rain. So I think a lot of you this summer have noticed that there have been, a, I, I don't know if you have noticed, I have noticed, <laughs> that there's a lot of geoengineering going on. The clouds have this symmetric 
uh, form. That means that some hub plant are, are working on this specific cloud. It goes up and then we have bad weather. And that is also why you see that when we actually should have a very cloudless sky, the airplanes are going like this and then they are artificially creating a low pressure front. And the funny thing is that if you look at the United States this year, they have drought, very, very bad drought. They have been hit by severe geoengineering activity. And at the same time, and that means the harvest is very bad. And at the same time, Russia have had a drought. And most of the time, the wind is coming from west, so that means the, 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 the weather fronts over the Atlantic are going over Denmark, Sweden, and then going to Russia. And in Russia, I saw, I also have that um, uh, documented in my article, the wheat uh, production of 2012 is 30% less than 2011. So I'm just wondering, you can call this speculation, but I'm wondering, is there a reason why we had this very bad summer and they also have drought in Russia. I think there is, and as Kissinger, he has said, if you control the food supply, you control the people. Thank you. I am going to start now. Please take your seats. And fasten your seat belts. I'm taking you on a ride, and it's not a merry-go-round. Chemtrails, the health effects of the toxic sky war on all of us. Well, that sums it all up, I would say. I form the light and create the darkness. I make peace and create evil. I the Lord do all of these things. What God is that? The God of the chemtrails, no doubt. Problem, reaction, solution, the Hegelian threesome. Chemtrails create sickness. And when people fall sick, they ask for help from the state and the health insurance and the health care. That is something that I pronounce differently. I say the hell scare. <laughs> I have this play with words sometimes. And the healthcare system is waiting for a way to get our DNA. And they get that by way of the heel prick of babies, uh, the test, uh, how you say that, uh, the uitstrijkjes, the, the, for the HPV uh, con uh, checks with women and other uh, medical procedures, they get your DNA without you giving consent, but they, they will have it. And that DNA, if that goes into the electronic patient information data systems, then they could have an N is one situation. They can figure out exactly which person reacts in which way on which challenge. And that is what is very interesting, of course, for Big Pharma and such. Um, these, oh, about chemtrails, there is so much to tell. Do I need to do like that? Yeah, I, it's, I, it's my breathing, huh? Yeah. I breathe too. <laughs> Chemtrails, the bigger picture. Uh, I go to the substances and not all in this order probably, but there is so much to tell that I try to tell a lot about it because the more you know, the more you are equipped to fight this thing. And it is a aware, awareness fight. The more people know about it, the more we can protest against it and make a fist towards governments to say, stop this foolishness. So, 
The United Nations, some people think, is a beneficial organization. Well, if you look at the logo, it's the world in a grid. And chemtrails play a role in that too. And we can only be kept in the cages we refuse to see. Because if we know that we are in a cage, we don't want to be there. This is a mural in the UN headquarters in New York. And when you look here, you see the phoenix. And it's not rising from its ashes. It is shedding its skin like a snake. Meaning that we are talking about Lucifer here. This is a particularly nice guy, Mr. Zygniew Brzezinski. He wrote a book in 1970 and he said, such a society would be dominated by an elite unrestrained by traditional values. Hmm, interesting. Soon it will be possible to assert almost continuous surveillance over every citizen. The globalization has actually created the conditions for powerful neo-fascist movements. Big Brother is watching you, and it never stops. And they tell you what they do. They want to exploit for strategic political purposes the fruits of research on the brain and on human behavior. I have a book by NATO of a workshop in the 1980s in Greece about the biology of aggression. And one of the articles in that book is by the Jose Delgado that Barry Trower was talking about. So you see, it is all like that. And that's, that is what I'm trying to do here, to help you recognize the patterns and make the connections, because it's all interconnected. Whatever happens to us, nothing is coincidental, and everything is interlocked with everything else. To develop a system that would seriously impair brain performance of large populations in selected regions over an extended period. Well, that's basically what Frank touched upon. Which way do I do it? Up? Better up? Like that? Out? Out. Okay. So they are after our brain performance. Have you ever had a moment that you thought, why the heck am I feeling depressed right now? I don't know where that's coming from. Well, that is this system at work. Because with this system, they can make a whole region depressed or aggressed or whatever. Your mood has a frequency and they can play with that. Techniques for conducting secret warfare. One nation may attack a competitor covertly by bacteriological means. In chemtrails are strange phenomena we will see later. Techniques of weather modification could be employed to produce prolonged periods of drought or storm. Yes, we've seen that. Frank said so. Frank told us about that. I have seen that in Australia this year, at the beginning of, of this year. Enormous floods, rain in the Blue Mountains, no end. Global warming? I don't think so. I've never been so cold in that summer down under. This is a quote from an email that I got of someone who hadn't got a clue about chemtrails. And she was in the sun and was admiring the beautiful lines in the sky. Are they really poisonous? Hmm. We'll answer that. And she went in when having a headache and her lungs were painful, and still are. I can feel my eyes and my lungs when I have driven a long distance, because then you have a lot of air, so you take in a lot of the pollution that is there. Part of that pollution is chemtrail pollution. Come down. So, can't we be outside anymore? Well, you have to pay attention. This is an important slide, because nobody 
actually realizes so much that the health adverse effects are always chemtrails plus something else. And that can be vaccines or water fluoridation or the Western medicine and the dentistry. By the way, I have a two-hour radio program with Hel Huggins that uh, the first speaker of today was talking about. Listen to it and you will get an education in true dentistry, additional to what we had this morning. Uh, Western medicine has a lot of standard procedures and tests that are dangerous. Chemotherapy, beautiful example of that. Implants. Uh, dentistry, by the way, is a beautiful way to implant you with a chip or something else, without you knowing. Airport body scans is radiation, period. Don't go through them. The you, uh, European Union has a letter on the internet that it's not mandated. You can say as a passenger, uh-uh, I don't want to go through that. They will fill you up, but that's better than going ha and having your DNA damaged, isn't it? And they did that to me when I went to Australia and well, they were actually checking whether I was wearing a tampon that far. Amazing. GM food crops, poison to our cells and our DNA. Chernobyl, Fukushima, depleted uranium, all those things still going on, by the way. Chemicals, pesticides, industrial pollution, of course. Uh, dirty electricity, computers, cell phones, well, we had that covered. Food processing and food additives and everything with the codex. The food that we have is in quality nowhere near what it was at the beginning of the last century. The vitamin <coughs> content is so much less and I have a document from the American Senate Commission in 1936 that they are complaining that the food already is 50% less in vitamins than before. So now we are almost a century onwards. It will be even worse right now. Power lines, ELF, ULF, Escort, that was all in Barry Trower's uh, speech. Toxic food packaging, radiation of our food. Well, when you radiate the food, the proteins are changed. Uh, even so in microwave ovens. Teflon cookware. Teflon is fluor, so that's not a good idea. Aluminum pans is not such a good idea either. And then we have things that go to our brain, it's like the, the musical tone A that has been changed from 432 hertz to 440, which is a difference, but it tweaks the natural sound, natural frequency. Pop music is Tavistock, is mind control. Hollywood shows in their films what they are planning to do to us. And then when we comment on that, they say, yeah, but it's just a movie. Uh-uh-uh. Really look at those movies and see what they have in store for you. Television, of course, is mind control. And mainstream media, yeah, is lamestream media. <laughs> Absolutely, I agree. Um, persistent jet contrails, these white lines in the sky are called chemtrails. And what they do with it is stratospheric aerosol geoengineering and weather modification. I hate that word because I think it's weather manipulation. Call a spade a spade, then you know what you're talking about. And this is all the ways that they are doing that. Uh, increased precipitation, reduced precipitation, air capture, solar radiation management, and ocean fertilization. All man-made artificial ways to play with our environment and not with healthy results, I can tell you. Chemtrails and sunlight, that connection is clear for everybody. And that's why I want to go into what light means for our organism. 
Every life on earth starts with light. This is the sun. And the sunlight is an essential micro, macro nutrient. That means essential. When we get too little, we get sick. When we don't get it, we die. And a macronutrient is a nutrient that you need to have in maximum dosage. And chemtrails, of course, do things with our sunlight that make that we have less of it. This is the whole spectrum from the sun, and the colored lines is the visible spectrum for us. And within that visible spectrum are different areas, but I'm always wondering how do chemtrails deform this light spectrum when it arrives at our bodies, at our eyes. There is, and I'll tell you why I come to that thought, there is a doctor in America, Lee Cowden, he is a very well-known doctor in the Lyme arena, one of my other subjects that I'm well versed in. He uses a laser pointer, and when you put a laser pointer on a surface, you have a red dot. Then he puts on a yeah, a, a plastic, uh, how you say that, a, a straw, sort of, uh, that you use around electrical lines. And he has a hole in it so he can, can put a test tube with some material in it. And if he puts the test tube in it and puts the red light through the test tube, he, you get a line. And in that sense, he, put that but he puts that line, he scans that line along the body of somebody. And that means that the information that is in the light, in the laser light, will resonate with the substances in that body of the test tube. And it means that that is a detoxifying method. And he did that with a pilot, a who went to the Amazon um, area and he had kerosene in his test tube and he scanned this pilot and they had to leave the room because of the utter stench of kerosene that came out of this pilot. It's a very powerful detox way. You have to know what you're doing, of course, and never shine into the eyes, but this is amazing. I find it fascinating. So, when you translate that to sunlight going through chemtrails with whatever is in them, what is the quality of light that comes to us? What is being resonating, resonated within us with that sort of light? I've never heard anybody address that question. So I don't have the answer yet. This is to show you what different light spectra are. The, the yellow line is sunlight, so you have the full spectrum in a sort of bell curve type of thing. The red light is the old, well-known light that we used to have, you know, the. the the normal old light bulbs. Um, the light blue line is a barcode scanning laser, and the blue line, and then you can see the dark blue line the, goes like that, is a mercury vapor line lamp. That means that the message to the brain from this light spectrum is a very erratic lesson. I have an instrument. I didn't bring it, but I have it. It's a little instrument that translates light waves into sound waves. So if you put it onto a light, you will hear what that light sounds. So if you put it into the sun, you have a hum. When you have it on a, an old-fashioned light bulb, it will be because with the alternate, alternating current, the electricity is on and off and on and off, but since the lamp will not be totally out before it's lit up again, you have a, z a hum, but it's not, it's not 
uh, and nice. I mean, you can handle it. But if you have this mercury lamp, you can imagine that it sounds like D -d 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 -d. and that is the message that the light gives to your brain, even if you don't notice it yourself with your consciousness. So that is the influence that light can have. And you can go even further, you can put messages into light. So you can do uh, subliminal messages. So I want to go to, uh, ho uh, what's what they called, a uh, big uh, store, uh, chain store, and um, see what they have sort of messages in their lamps. Go to the third floor and buy da 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 something. Or uh, a message against pickpocketing pocketing or something, or, or shoplifting. You can do anything. Sunlight enters into our biological systems in two different ways. By the eyes, and 15% of the light we use to be able to see, and the rest of it is information, light information, that goes to the hypothalamus. And from there on, it goes to all different systems in the body. We have three billion messages per minute to the brain through our eyes and two billion are from the eyes directly. And it's funny, this is the sun and this is our eye, inside of our eye. It's very similar. The eyes are the windows of the soul and the highway to the brain. And again, very important in this light aspect. They are 2% of our body, body weight, eyes and brain, but 25% of our nutritional intake. 70% of the body's sense receptors and the entry point of 90% of all the information that we get in our system during our lifetime. So our eyes are very, very, very important. And visual problems are generally in 9% of the population. But when you have a population of depressed people, schizophrenics and alcoholics, then 66% has eye problems. Interesting. Sunlight inhibitors. When we are inside, behind glass, in our car, of course, sunglasses, the best way to give yourself cancer is to always wear sunglasses. Chemtrails and sunscreens and another radio program that I made was with Elizabeth Plourd about sunscreens and it's a horrific story. So don't listen before you go to sleep. Global dimming means changes in the light spectrum. But if we have no or not enough sunlight, no photosynthesis takes place within plants. And in our skin, no vitamin D3 can form, as Scott Tips told us. And that means that we have not a functioning, not a well-functioning immune system. So this lack of light is a big, big problem in many aspects. The second way that we get light from the sun is by way of our food, because here you see the different chlorophylls, uh, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, and the point is, if you want to eat healthy, have many colors on your plate. Paint your dinner, I'd say. This is a short explanation about photosynthesis. The cells between the layers of the, the tree leaves uh, have all sorts of little thingies in which they can create substance from the biophotons of the sun. And this is one such a cell and I'm not really going into that, but just the idea. And if you see plant cells under a microscope, here they are at rest. And they are green here, but they make me remind, make, they remind me of red blood cells in live blood analysis. And 
Okay, come on. Yeah, here we go. This is a film, and I will show you a small part of it because it, it stays the same. But this is how plant cells behave to pick up the light from the sun. Each gets its turn on the best position to take in the most sunlight. Amazing, huh? When you think of a forest and you hear the leaves, what is inside the leaves is this. It's even more activity. Well, you can find it on YouTube for yourself, but this is very important and that's why sunlight is universally important for our health. So, when we eat all these plants, we feed ourselves with sunlight because what the plants had changed sunlight into photosynthesis into matter, that matter we eat and our system translates it back to light, to biophotons that go through our system. And this is a way of going gardening in the next period when the shops are not there anymore, square foot gardening, and it's fun. But don't expect everything to grow the way you want it because the nature has a lot of surprises. But it might be our garden, but how toxic is it with the chemtrails? That's a bit of a question. And in the film, uh, why the hell, no. <laughs> Why are they spraying? Why in the world are they spraying? The first one was, what in the world are they spraying? You know this film by Mark, Michael Murphy? Yeah. He has now a, a second uh, edition, Why in the World? And um, the people in Hawaii explain that they have put up a glass house for their vegetables because of the fallout in the sky by the chemtrails. They couldn't be organic gardening anymore because there was so much muck coming down from the sky. Then I come to diet. What we eat is determining to how we think. What we think determines how we feel. And from our feelings, we act or not. But whatever we do, when we act from our feelings, then we create a result in the world, and that is the situation we have around us. So diet is number one in this whole series. I have an example here. This is boy twins. When they are 50 years older, they will have had 100, 150,000 meals. If these meals were healthy, like this, then you have very happy, healthy 50 plus year old twins. But this one, you can buy that and put it in your cupboard and look 20 years later and it will be exactly the same. It won't take 50 years for you to be like this. <laughs> this is awful, of course, but the beautiful message herein is if you change your diet from the left side to the right side, your body is very compliant to change back into normal shape and back to health. But your taste buds will be ruined by this hamburger king or whatever it is. So the way back to healthy food is very difficult in your mind also. But it can be done. The power of biophotons, and I show this because I want to stress how important the sunlight is for us and what you can do when you apply sunlight technology into equipment. And it's not to, to advertise this, but I have been working with this scientist who designed this, and I have seen the results. It's amazing. I will show you. The sun sends out light, and sunlight is bio-photons. Bio is life, and photon is light. 
living light. Well, this scientist, Dieter Josner in Germany, has created this uh, instrument with two times 64 LED lamps, 64 in the infrared zone and 64 in the white light zone, according to the light of the sun. So it's bio-identical light waves. And these bio-identical light, light waves can give the cell energy. If you have a treatment with this instrument, your cells will be fed photons. Bio-identical to biophotons. And this instrument doesn't heal anything, but it gives energy to your cells so your cells can switch on their own innate healing mechanism. That is the science behind it. And I will give you some examples. This was a man's leg after four years of medical treatment. A diabetic person. This leg needed to be amputated. I warn you, it's rather graphic, but <laughs> it proves my point. Start of the hyperphoton laser therapy, and the black thing is a magnetic ring, so they add magnetic waves to the light waves. And after four weeks, this leg was looking like this, and did not need to be amputated. This is an 84-year-old woman with cancer and metastasis in every organ. And this was her foot. She was in a room with another person who was going to be treated by the hyperphoton. And they thought, well, what the hell, let's give this poor old lady also a treatment on her foot. Because, yeah, the instrument is here, so let's do it. So, this was the starting point. This was after one week. This was her foot after two weeks. And this was her food after four weeks. This is the power of light in our body. Lack of sunlight is, again, very stressful to every living organism in the world. It is required, full spectrum sunlight is required for all life on Earth. It's necessary for vitamin D3 synthesis for the food crops, and it is a disinfectant for molds, fungi, mildews, and viruses. So it has many different properties. And it's an alternate energy source. Although Dane Wigington in the film What on Earth Are They Spraying? What in the World Are They Spraying? He says that 50 to 60% of the solar uptake in his panels is what he is experiencing in California. So even worse than the 20% that Frank was mentioning. Now, and he says the particles are being put up at a height of 20 to three, 23 to 27 kilometers, spread out in a laminar pattern, and they take two and a half to five years to fall back to Earth. And the barium that is being used is 10,000 times more toxic than lead and aluminum does bloody murder on our ecosystems. Ultraviolet light has a lot of properties. It helps increase our metabolism and our sex hormones and our heart efficiency and our natural vitamin D production and our calcium absorption. The blood calcium goes down, the blood pressure goes down as a result of that, the blood cholesterol goes down, Ultraviolet light helps with weight loss, and it treats psoriasis, and it eases breathing with asthma. Vitamin D3 hormone has many, many functions in the body. Calcium absorption, it is involved with bone growth, density and strength, and it modulates cell growth, maturation and proliferation, and abnormal cell growth like cancer is being stopped or 
less, made less. Immune T cells, that are the Pac-Man cells to get rid of um, pathogens that have entered the body, they are enhanced, and insulin production is enhanced, and the risk for type e, be it diabetes type 1 and 2 is less. And vitamin D3, it's not a vitamin actually, it's a hormone, because it, it, it works more like a hormone than a vitamin. And it prevents muscle strength, uh, preserves muscle strength after exercise, and the osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, and depression, and the cancer of colon, prostate, and breast is also has a better chance when you have more vitamin D3 on board, but that is what Scott Tips already told us. Vitamin D3 the, uh, deficiency is what we are seeing right now in America, and it causes rickets. Uh, in Holland, we call it the English sickness, and it means that the bone structure of children is n malformed. So, yeah, you, you create invalids, in a way. And, of course, nothing is ever because of one cause. There's always more things. And vitamin D3 deficiency is poor diet, vaccine-induced diseases, chemtrails. That three of the possibly more causes for vitamin D deficiency. And it affects absorption of calcium and phosphorus from the intestine and the reabsorption of phosphorus by the renal tubules. So you don't have to <laughs> learn that by heart. I, I only try to convey to you that there are many processes in the body that are very important that are being interfered with if we don't have enough vitamin D3 on board. And that's directly related with the sun. And yes, people with a dark skin really have problems. So people who live in the northern climates with a dark skin, I have neighbors from uh, Burundi, pitch black, beautiful kids. They need every day suppletion of vitamin D3. Okay, back to the chemtrails. Um, I found many stuff, many substances that are in chemtrails, but the list is, goes on and on and on. These are just some examples. But what you can say from this page, these are all substances that have no place in our bodies. Some might say, well, yeah, you, have, you need a little bit of chromium because with the diabetes, yes. Which chromium? In which compound? In which form? Chemical form? Because there is a big difference too. The one uh, combination is healthy for us and the other is toxic. And I I'm a journalist, I, sing, I see these things, and you can, I'm not a biochemist, so I can't really explain, but I know where to find the information, and that is what is important. And that's what I'm trying to convey to you, know where you find the information, so you can look it up if you need the information. So, um, all these metals mean that the air is no longer neutral because these particles are electromagnetically charged. So the air is changed in quality. And then here I have a non-exhaustive list of non-metallic substances, and this is really sick. <laughs> these are substances that they have actually found in laboratory samples. Blood and plasma, mold spores, fungi, but mutated. Mycotoxins, very dangerous. Ethylene bromide, polymer fibers, polyethylene silicon fibers. Then we go to the direction of Morgellons disease. I'll come to that. Exotic strains of bacteria. I know that since, well, basically since there are people on Earth, they have been playing around with pathogens. But especially uh, when Fort Detrick and Plum Island came into being in America, these are bio-war laboratories, they have been fooling around with pathogens, viruses and bacteria, really no end. 
and they have been making combinations and well one of the pet pathogens that they have is uh, smallpox flu but also rabies and rabies i come to that later so i say that but rabies they have changed around so that it can be spread through the air you don't need to be bitten by a rabid dog to get rabies anymore i come to that sedatives crystalline substances uh, nanoparticulates parasitic nematode eggs self-replicating nano machines and infectious pathogens and they the last sound almost non interesting after all the other stuff this is the same slide in a different uh, way that uh, Frank showed so this is how much more of these substances was at some point in the air in Phoenix not very healthy and uh, for the electromagnetic frequencies our body is also frequencies that is why we now have uh, gadgets almost you could say like uh, or medical instruments for the complementary therapist like the my health from the Ness family nutri energetic systems that is by Peter Fraser an Australian scientist and Ness technology works on the energetic levels of your body you have a sort of mouse where you put your hand on and the program reads from your hand the situation in that moment in your body all right do you have many toxins how is your vitamin status uh, all that sort of thing and then you can treat with the machine by feeding the energies that the body apparently needs and also they have bottles with energy in the bottles and in, in, in water in liquid and that will help your body if you take those those drops that will help your body to go back to the healthy level that you need to have to go back to full health and of course there is a system that you start at the most toxic point detoxing that and then go in line layers up to the most possible health situation of a person and now they have the my health that is a handheld instrument where you can uh, treat people on body cancer contact with it because there are electrodes on it but you can also put it on a field modus and then you can treat people and they have the field the beneficial field around them and they can sit with that one of the programs is for instance um, when you travel they have the Chinese organ clock and if you put that on your body you will bring your body to the time frame of the destination a lot quicker it's amazing stuff really fascinating so all our cells are molecules that are in vibration they have a frequency all our organs have a, have a specific frequency and the frequencies that are sent out to us from our environment not through the chemtrails but by way of the chemtrails with the use of of the, the cloud forming that they can send stuff to a certain area we are being influenced in a way that we are as I said can be in a mood that is not our idea not our depression but <laughs> dictated by the environment of something that we cannot see but well we do react on to so anything interfering with the original body communication centers that may result in disease in disbalance of the situation in our body and that is sickness and yes surprise surprise chemtrails have barium and aluminium and harp what Frank was ta talking about already runs on electro uh, extreme low frequencies this is the x-band radar and that scans the system for barium if you have barium in your body you light up like a white person like a white being 
what do cancer colon patients get? They get barium stuff in their colon and then they take a picture so they can see where the barium went and where not. So where there is an obstruction or a tumor or whatever. One of those standard procedures of medicine that I'm not so impressed with. The um, aluminium in your system by way of toothpaste, uh, antacids, um, deodorants, chemtrails, vaccines, that turns you into an antenna for both these systems. So now you are a perfect component for these two systems to work against you. Without our knowledge and consent, it just happens. They are playing with us. And now I come to Morgellons disease. I came across Morgellons disease in 2004 on a Lyme conference in San Francisco. And Morgellons disease makes this sort of thing possibility. It's, it's ludicrous, really, but it's happening. And the people who have Morgellons are not believed. They are ridiculed. It's between your ears. You are crazy, this, that, and the other. But what I see that this Morgellons disease is part of a technology like transgenics and transhumanism. It's eugenics on steroids. We are being rewired from the inside. They want to change us, apparently, into <laughs> slave work units, not too intelligent, but hardworking, no questions asked, and not too long around on this earth. But nanofibers, fibers and other nanopolymers are self-assembling into intelligent transceiver arrays with apparent video lenses and audio pickups. There are microscopic photos from stuff that came out of Morgellons patients, and I will show you some pictures, that even had lettering on it, leading it back to a Dutch company of some nefarious nanotechnology stuff. I don't know exactly what, because nobody exactly knows what it is. But recently there was a very, very important study, and one of the participants in this study, Raphael Stricker, I know him from the Lyme arena, Lyme disease arena. They have looked at three Morgellons disease patients. And Morgellons disease is an emerging multi-system illness characterized by unexplained dermopathy and unusual skin-associated filament production. In other words, people with Morgellons disease have stuff coming, crawling under their skin that they don't know what it is, don't know where it comes from. It itches like hell if it's all over them. They really live in hell. People have been committing suicide because it was excruciating what was happening with their body and you don't have any say in the matter. If you take something out, uh, strange things happen. Um, the fibers protest. Uh, they apparently talk to each other. They, they communicate. It's, it's amazing. But this study, for the first time, with chemical and light microscopic and immunohistological evidence shows that the filaments associated with Morgellons disease come from human epithelial cells, epithelial is skin cells, supporting the hypothesis that the fibers are composed of keratin and are products of keratinocytes, cells that have to do with your hair. This study is so important because it proves that Morgellons disease is not delusional and that skin lesions with these strange idiotic fiber stuff coming out is not self-inflicted and not psychogenic. So in other words, psychiatrists go play in another sandbox because this is real and it's horrific for the people. These are 
photographs, microscopic photographs of this study to show what they have found in different places in the body. And the upper thing is that they found here in the webbing of fingers. And these filaments have different colors, different textures, they grow, they communicate with each other. Uh, it's not in these slides, but there have been, I have somewhere on my computer, photographs of these things showing that there is an, uh, like a, a lens of a camera at the end of a fiber. So it appears that this technology is not of this earth. At least it's a technology not within the science as you and I know science. It's light years ahead. Nobody knows exactly where it's coming from and mainstream medicine ignores, says you're crazy, it's between your ears uh, and that sort of thing. But now this study shows, no, it's not between your ears, it's real. Now here's some fibers, I mean, blue threads and, and, and strange things, I mean, that's not in our body in a natural way. And there is, seems to be a connection with chemtrails and Morgellons disease. But nobody knows where exactly it's coming from, so I can't tell you. But it's interesting enough to know about it, so you are forewarned. ISIS is Science in Society. It's a British uh, website. Uh, Mei Wan Ho is the uh, main uh, scientist there. She does great work in terms of uh, genetic manipulation of uh, food, crops and that such. And um, she has been investigating nanoparticulates also. And she says that these are accumulating in the liver, the spleen, and in bone marrow, in the brain, and in the lymph nodes. So in other words, everywhere. And I don't know whether I have it here, but there is a Chinese study of workers in a factory dealing with nanoparticles and all these women, all these workers got cancer from the nanoparticles. That was proven. So, well, here I have a whole list of what these toxic metals all can do. Uh, I will put this up maybe on the website um, in the form of a PDF so you can look for yourself. It's mainly lists of what aluminum will do. Um, aluminum, of course, is related to Alzheimer's, to dementia, to ADHD, that sort of thing. There was a class, a school class, that was treated, treated on Capri Zone, that is the orange juice in, in, in so floppy aluminum uh, package. They could drink it to their heart's delight. Within a month, the whole class was ADHD because of the aluminum that comes into the orange juice because it is acidic and bingo. So they had to detox to get rid of the ADHD again. So that is what aluminum can do. On different levels, it ruins the P53, that is the system in the body that cancer cells are being killed by the body. If you don't have that system in place anymore, you will get cancer and it will be awful. Well, barium, that's the last one I will show you and the rest I will go through very quickly till I come to the end. Barium um, will take out potassium of the human organism and all these substances like sodium, potassium and, uh, and, and, and calcium, they have a function in processes in the body. So if you have those substances in disbalance, then you have the processes in disbalance and you have the body in disbalance or even disease. And barium and aluminum work together in diffusing and strengthening an electric charge. So, well, barium, some more, cadmium, nickel, chromium, thorium, non-metal toxins, ethylene bromide, 
very toxic. Doesn't matter how, but it's not supposed to be in our body. Mycotoxics and fungi and molds are, of course, very toxic to us. No good thing to have. And they can give you effects in your hormonal balance, like as more estrogen. Uh, they can cause cancer. They can cause changes, uh, birth defects, and other changes to normal situation in the body. This is um, the droplets that you were talking about um, that form around particulates. Aluminum in the soil will kill trees. This is aluminum and fish. Well, fish don't like aluminum either. That's clear. Aluminum and plants. The smaller the particle, the greater the effect. And these are just some food crops, but basically no food crop can handle aluminum in this way. So it ruins everything. And we are the last in the food chain, so we get the top of the bill of all the stuff that is in chemo, uh, in chemtrails and in the stuff that these animals have eaten or have been injected with. So organic is very important. Protection, yeah, stay out of the ring, also important in terms with, uh, of uh, Fukushima, because every ring will bring also Fukushima uh, radiation to us. Grow your veggies under glass. Vitamin C, um, detox, 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 but that's an art. You need to do that with the help of a true professional. And then vitamin C again is very important. I buy it twice, 25 kilos at a time, sodium ascorbate, I eat. When I fly to Australia, I have 30 grams a day. That's something else than 60 milligrams, huh? Homeopathy can help with detox, detoxification, but also know which person to go to. Literature to read is Dr. Russell, Russell Blaylook, Dr. Mark Circus, and Dr. Rebecca Carley. These are people who really know their business in this sense. Uh, Rebecca Carley says, silica C30 will bring strange body to, bodies to the surface of the skin, so you can take them out. Maybe that might work with Morgellons. I have no clue. I haven't heard it yet, but keep it in mind. Patrick Jordan, this is a um, researcher into the vaccine arena. He says, identify the enemy, alert the herd, that's what I'm doing, and defend yourself. Awareness, connection, action, that's what we need. My website is underneath, there you find the radio programs that I was talking about, and my previous chemtrail presentation with other subjects that I cover, and that was it. <laughs>